I don't know if Diane Louise Salinger is related to JD. Yeah. Uh, my next line, but I do know she's related to Pierre. Okay. Okay, which is very cool. Um, she with the smoky voice and Hollywood glamour and hearty infectious laugh. Whenever she's been amongst us, you oh, cannot miss yeah. when Diane is in the house. It's so wonderful. Okay, she's an award-winning actress, director, and coach who's worked with such luminaries as Clint Eastwood, Woody Allen, Tim Burton. She's recognized for her portrayal as Apollo for her portrayal of Apollonia, the fortune teller mother in the HBO series Carnival, and as Simone, the waitress in the cult classic Huey's Big Adventure. <laughs> and, and actually, Lynn Stewart also, Miss Yvonne, she's going to be reading for us soon, too. Okay. Um, she also played the Penguin's mom in Tim Burton's Batman Returns and Steve Buscemi Shrink in Ghost World. Diane recently completed shooting two films, Stitch opposite Edward Furlong, American History X, he's hot, and Henry Jaglum's Just 45 Minutes from Broadway with our very own Harriet Schock Yay. and Julie Davis. We have to all go see that together. We have to do that, yes. everybody together. We must all sit there and scream and yell and carry on. Okay, when is it coming out? When is it coming out? It's a Henry So you never know. Okay. <laughs> okay, Diane has performed, uh, has performed um, uh, opposite many award-winning actors, Academy Award-winning actors and nominees, including George Clooney, Jeff Bridges, Forrest Whitaker, Michael Caine, and Gary Oldman. Oh my God. Her TV. Do you get to sleep with your co stars? <laughs> Her TV credits include Curb Your Enthusiasm, CSI, before mentioned, and How I Met Your Mother. Diane was honored as Mistress of Ceremonies and President of the Jury of the Monaco International Film Festival. She is the founder and director of the Diane Le Louise Salinger Acting Academy, where she trains and coaches actors, writers, directors, such as Catherine Hardwick, director of the hit film. Twilight. Your cred in my house is, I told my daughter, she was like, oh my God. <laughs> Ladies, please welcome Diane Louise Salinger. <laughs> It's great to be here. I, I'm going to cry a lot. I just want to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I cry when I get up. Um, this is really the first time I've ever read my, re my writing in front of other people. Um, okay. Uh, this is, um, I'm developing a screenplay based on this. So. I got to tell you, you feel much more naked doing your own work than you ever do as, uh, as, a, as a performer, as an actress. It's, you feel wide open naked. It's very, whew. Okay. We like your naked. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, it's called The Tear and the Veil. I hope I can read this. <coughs> Kate. A quirky, spirited girl of 18 flies in a single-engine plane piloted by a middle-aged man. Do you want to do it, he asks. Sure, she replies, not quite sure what he means. <laughs> the man shoots the plane straight up until it is perpendicular to the earth. The engine suddenly stops, and the plane falls hundreds of feet in seconds, leaving the girl's stomach high above her. She does everything she, ca she can not to puke. As they fall fast, the upward force of the wind pushes against the propeller and miraculously starts the engine again. The plane levels out just in time. The girl looks over at her father. He laughs and put his hand on her thigh. Do you recognize down there? The girl, still green, looks out the window. That's our house! Their house is one of many toy houses below, surrounded by lush broccoli stick trees straight out of a train set. The girl marvels, it's like we're dead and we've come back. Jean smiles adoringly at his daughter. 
In his Maserati, he blasts Count Basie's satin doll with Ella Fitzgerald as he tears through Chestnut Hill, a conservative suburb of Philadelphia. Kate vamps along with Ella, imitating her velvet tones. She sings to her father, and he loves it. This is their ritual. As they enter their English tutor house laughing, a pair of dark stockinged Marlena Dietrich legs descend the winding staircase. Legs that go high, high up. Interrupt. Oh, God. As Hemingway says, write what hurts. Legs that go high, high up, interrupted by the barest black velvet hut pants, a giant sequin butterfly belt, and a puffy blouse. This is Regina. Her name means queen in Latin. She stops her descent three steps above her husband and oldest daughter, who look up at her in horror. Mom, you're not going to the grams like that. Yes, I am, Regina slurs slightly, already buzzed. Her two youngest oh, okay. Her two younger daughters, hearing the commotion, come out to the stairs. It's not Hall it's not Halloween, Mom, the youngest pleads. Jean tries to take charge. Pudge, that's his nickname for her. Go up and change now. No. I'm going like this. And if you don't like it, tough. You're late as usual. You'll have to have you'll ha you'll just have to go the way you are. The girl and her father look at each other, resigned, and follow Regina out to the car. The Chestnut Hill party is in full swing. Women in page boy dues with blouses ever so slightly open to reveal the family string of pearls. The men laughing politely at jokes no one finds funny. Kate and her father talk avidly in front of the fireplace in their own world. A slightly tipsy... Ah, oh God. A slightly tipsy daughter of the American Revolution sidles up to Regina. Pudge, who's that cute young thing Jean's with? Regina downs her drink, her blurry eyes fixed on her husband and daughter. Soon after, Jean drives home, Jean drives, soon after, Jean drives home, stone-faced, as Regina quietly cries next to him. Kate sits silently in the back. Suddenly, Regina shouts, stop the car, stop! the car. Jean slams on the brakes. Regina throws open the door, gets out, and proceeds to walk down the middle of the road in her hut pants and high heels. Pudge, get back in the car, Jean pleads as he drives beside her, the passenger door still open. No, she retorts like a child and keeps walking. Mom, we're miles from home. You can't walk all the way home. No, she cries. Jean and Kate finally coax her back into the car until it dawns on her that she's not going to make it walking. As soon as Diane gets home, she washes her face. Uh, Diane, go ahead and change that. Woo. As, soon as, Kate, as soon as Kate gets home, she washes her face in her ba bathroom, drained. That's okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Just breathe. Okay. As soon as Kate gets home, she washes her face in her bathroom, drained. She hears her parents arguing downstairs. Do you know how embarrassed I was? So who's that cute young thing Jean's with? What was I supposed to say? Regina's voice rises and sobs. I'm your wife, Jean. I'm your wife. She's your daughter, and I'm your wife. Pudge, don't be ridiculous, Jean quietly tries to calm her down. In the bathroom, Kate stares into her eyes in the mirror, horrified at the pain she has caused. A few days later, a middle-aged woman counselor leads the family in a therapy session. We're here today because Regina feels there is a real problem. It's good that you are all joining her. I understand Diane has rallied you all here. By the end of the session, Jean slumps, the wind taken out of him. I thought the only thing I had to do was to love my daughters, just love them. The counselor comes down hard on him. No, Mr. Salinger, that is not enough. <clears throat> Regina looks on, vindicated but sad. Back home, 
Kate finds her father leaning against the door frame of his bedroom, crying. She approaches him sadly. You sure you don't want to come to the movies with us? He shakes his head, unable to speak. She says in a whisper, I love you so much, that's why I have to break away. He can't stop crying. I know, I know. They stare at each other a long moment. Then Kate turns, walks down the stairs, yelling at the top of her lungs to her sisters and mother, Come on, guys, we're going to be late for the movie! Jean stands in the door frame, lost, devastated. Two weeks later, in a train station at rush hour, Kate calls her mother to tell her she's missed the train. Regina cuts her off. Jean's had a massive heart attack in Atlantic City. I don't know that I should be reading this. He was about to fly home with your sister and her boyfriend, what's his name, when the pain got bad. Thank God, otherwise they would have all been killed in a crash. Get here as fast as you can. We're chartering a plane down there tonight. Kate hangs up, up the phone in shock. Exactly one year later, on the anniversary of her father's death, Kate is rehearsing a scene from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar as she plays Portia, pushing her servant boy to run to the Capitol before Julius Caesar is stabbed. Kate keeps flashing on her family, racing to Atlantic, Atlantic City, failing to get to her father before he dies. She breaks into a cold sweat. She stops and starts again her performance becoming more and more forced. To a relief, the director calls a break, and she asks a big, burly actor to join her for lunch, trying to hide her desperation. As Kate walks on a crowded sidewalk with the actor, she stops and starts to sway. Are you okay, he asks. Kate has a thought. Without Dad, I don't exist. And then it happens. Suddenly there's no more ground, and she starts to fall into a huge abyss. Her legs slide over the edge. She screams, no! The actor catches her as her legs buckle, and she throws her arms around his neck, holding on for dear life. She lets out a blood-curdling wail, no! And everything goes black. She falls weightlessly through the black void. A ticking of a clock, an old clock, a grandfather clock. She has the sensation of being little, held up by a man she doesn't recognize. He has long sideburns and a mustache. She looks at his face. He's crying. She looks down to see what he's looking at, a beautiful woman in a coffin with candles all around her. She lies in a Victorian wedding dress and is as white as the gown. The man gently speaks with an English accent to her in his arms. <laughs> You must never be afraid of anything, not even of death. Suddenly, Kate is pulled up into light, and she is once more back on the street, held close by the tall, burly actor. Are you okay, he asks again. She doesn't answer. She opens her eyes and notices the pedestrians making as wide a girth as possible around her. She clings to the actor and shuts her eyes again. What just happened? but I'm debating whether I think this is too personal to my own life and maybe I should, you know, distance myself and make it another woman and not me. And it, this story is about um, a modern girl who goes down like a wormhole and um, she goes into another time. And... Um, I tried to. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, it, it's about a woman I've been obsessed with for 30 years, um, and her name is Maud Gunn. She was William Butler Yeats's um, muse, and she was known as the Irish Joan of Arc. And she died two years after I was born. And I have been so, I want to play her for 
so long, and so I'm going to make this movie and play her. Yay! Wow. <laughs> Excellent. Wow. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for sharing your heart with us, and uh, that's, that's what this is. You know, Diane, when she first walked in, said, I don't know if I should read this, it's just a work in progress, but this isn't just about best-selling authors and Pulitzer Prize nominees and things like that. It's also about people who are working it out, and, and that was amazing. And just to be so moved yourself was so moving to behold, let alone the words, which were beautiful. So I encourage you to continue doing what you're doing and to keep reading. Um, another hand for Diane Salinger. Thank you.